everybody, this is Lloyd with Just Got Played, and today I'm going to be going through some games that I'm going to uh, get rid of that are going to leave my collection for one reason or another. Some of these games I bought and never got a chance to play and um, just could never get them to the table because no one was interested, or I may have gotten them um, to play a long time ago and they've kind of worn out their, their, their game time. Um, some of them are games I really wanted to like, and I played and I tried to like them, and I just really didn't, uh, whether it was the theme or the mechanisms not tying to the theme or whatever. So um, I have quite a few games because I'm doing this once. Uh, I don't do it all that often. Um, so I have quite a few games, so I might break this up into a couple videos just so you're not sitting here for a long time. And I'm going to kind of give a blurb on each game and why I'm getting rid of it. And um, you know, let me know in the comments what you think. If you've played the games, did I make a mistake? Um, I don't know exactly when this video will hit, so I may have already gotten rid of the game by the time you tell me I'm stupid for getting rid of the game. Um, but let's go ahead and start. Um, first up, leaving the collection, is Nyctophobia. Uh, so Nyctophobia, this was the Target Edition, so it's the Vampire Encounter. Um, this is a game that I got... Uh, shortly before the pandemic happened, and then because the pandemic happened, there was really no uh, way to play a game where you were constantly touching each other and having to rely on physical contact in order to play the game. So if you don't know what Nyctophobia is, uh, one player um, is playing the killer, in this case a vampire, um, and everyone else are playing kids, teens, whatever, lost in the woods, and they are trying to find their way back uh, to uh, rescue someone and then get back to the car. Now, the board is a map. Uh, it's like a maze, and it's made up of uh, shaped trees and whatnot. Um, and the players that are playing the teens can't see. They're wearing blackout glasses. Now, you can kind of see from the sides, but they're blacked out, so you can't actually see the board. And the point of the game is to um, feel your way around and use stuff like um, throwing rocks and making sounds and stuff like that in order to figure out where the killer is and the killer can see. So it relies a lot on the killer guiding the player's hands to their pieces um, so that they can feel, you know, within a certain area so they kind of know where to go and map, try to map out the maze of the board. Um, it's got a modular setup with the different maps you can make and you can probably make your own maps. Um, but again, like I said, because of the pandemic, uh, because of COVID, this just never made it to the table, and it's kind of in that time frame still. So I don't know when this is going to get to the table. And um, yeah, so I'm just going to go ahead and pass it on, and maybe somebody else that's got a you know a more close knit group, maybe a family, will be able to play it and not have to worry so much about touchy feely stuff and passing germs. So nyctophobia. Uh, next up on my list is Bioshock Infinite: Siege of Columbia. So this was a game I picked up on a warehouse sale. I got it for really cheap. It looked really good. I liked Bioshock license. Um, this is a two or four player game. It is a um, area control, I believe. Uh, it's been a while since I read the rules. It is a very dense game. Um, so there's there's all this stuff with voting and um, you know trying to become the president or or the leader of the of the Bioshock Infinite of the of uh, Columbia. And it just, I don't play a lot of two player games. It does, you can play four player um, where it's two on two. But again, this is just kind of one of those ones that's very dense um, to learn. And um, it has a really cool production value. Like it looks really neat. It's got, you know, blimps and all kinds of different size minis and dice and these, you know, nice boards and cards. Um, it's from Plat Hat. So overall, it's it's got really good reviews and it's a decent game, but it's just one that I'm never going to get to the table. And I've had it for about three or four years now, and it's just never gotten to the table because it's too heavy for um, anybody that I play with, you know, at home. And then if I go to a game day, it's very rare that there's, you know, just two people sitting around not playing a game. So it, it just doesn't fit anywhere in my gameplay uh, circle. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this one on. Maybe someone else will get, you know, better use out of it or really love the Bioshock license. So that's it. Uh, Bioshock Infinite. 
Uh, next up, we're going to go with Fallout, a post-nuclear board game for one to four players. Now, I like Fallout. I've played the old Fallouts, um, the old, you know, isometric ones. I played Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, Fallout 4. Um, I really dig Fallout. I like the post-apocalyptic theme. I like what's going on in this game. It has a modular setup where you're exploring the wasteland and um, you're going around. It's it's kind of like um, Star Wars Outer Rim in that, you know, there's it's very narrative based. Um, you are going to level your character up. You're rolling dice to... They, they kind of brought over the VAT system, so you're rolling dice to shoot stuff, and it'll have, like, you know, you shoot them in the arm or the leg or the head. Um, and you're trying to get in good with um, a particular faction that you're dealt out. Um, and it's really cool. Like, the narrative's good. It's got minis. It's a really good-looking game, and you play as different character types, so you're not just, you know, a vault person. You, you can play as, take a look at the back here, you can play as a mutant. You can play as one of the Brotherhood. You can play as a ghoul. So there's all these different cool play styles. Um, but I think what this suffered from is that it is a competitive game. And not only is it a competitive game, but you're playing also against the AI. Um, so the AI is playing and it's ramping up the game. And for a game that is very heavily narrative driven and story driven, it's forcing you through those stories as fast as possible. So you might have to choose to leave stuff um, on the table and just not explore it because you don't have time because you need to keep up with the AI that's moving the, the, the game timer forward. Um, and because of that, it doesn't let you live in the world. And because you can't live in the world, it kind of falls flat on the theme. Now, I know they put out a an expansion, but I just couldn't justify getting the expansion hoping that it would fix the base game. And the reason why I said the problem with it being competitive is because if you have a couple players playing or it goes up to four, um, the quests, unlike in Star Wars Outer Rim, the quests are not locked to the player who drew them. Not all of them. Some of them I believe are. But if I flip over a card that says, hey, you need to go over to this tile, find this tile, and that's where you're going to find you know, Vault 13, the Vault 13 token goes out and then anyone else can go find it and pick up the rest of that um, storyline and complete the storyline. Or I could complete three quarters of the storyline and someone could be right next to the ending part and just finish it off. Um, and the problem with that is that completing storylines will, you know, give you boost to your faction. So you're racing against the, the, the AI you're racing against another player. And then on top of that, when you do a quest, it's not even your quest. Like it, and, and again, some of them could be, you know, private quests that you get, but most of them are public information and anyone else can just go, you know, crash into your quest and take it over. Um, and that to me is, it just kind of defeats what the game is supposed to be about, which is this heavily narrative driven game. So because of that, um, although it's really cool, it's got a lot of cool stuff going on. You get the special marker, you know, like in, in the game, you get the special so you can level up um, just like the game. You equip stuff. You're doing all kinds of fighting. You're exploring. It's really cool. But they it seems like they just fumbled it on that that AI, um, you know, ramp up of the time where you're constantly if you play it by yourself so you can complete everything. You know, you're still playing against that that timer that's just ticking forward and forcing you to do stuff. And I really want to live and breathe in the world. And I think there's some some uh, fan made stuff that will, you know, kind of break it down and, and fix some of that and made it more of a co-op and kind of backed off the thing. But I never gave it a shot um, just because it just seemed like more work than what was there to to begin with. Um, I really think they missed the mark on this one. I know there's probably a lot of people that really love this game, but. It just, it took away the part that I really wanted, which was the narrative driven aspect of it. I wanted to be able to live and breathe in this world. And it feels like I'm always on the clock and it doesn't feel like the way I play Fallout, the video game, which is wandering around doing stuff without a clock telling me that I need to hurry up and get somewhere. Otherwise, the game's just going to end without. Me. So, um, yeah, Fallout, that is leaving my collection. Um, next up, we've got... Rap Gods. Um, so Rap Gods is a two to four player game where you are basically trying to become a rap god, right? So 
it's it's basically a lot of card play. The one cool element that it really has going for it is it's got uh, three different tracks. Um, and the main player board is this turntable and you're going around the tracks, um, leveling stuff up. So you have like bling and mic skills and um, I forgot what the third one is, but you're trying to level that stuff up so you can play more powerful cards and you basically play out your cards and it kind of tells a story of your career. It's really cool. Um, it's got a cool concept. It's got a lot of um, tongue in cheek stuff going on if you're into, you know, rap and hip hop. Um, but overall, the game just kind of fell flat um, for me and my group. Um, it does have this kind of a missed opportunity on um, you can get into a beef with someone and get into a rap battle, but then it just kind of comes down to rolling dice, almost like risk style. And um, that just seemed to kind of fall flat as well. Um, it's a really good production value. It's got, you know, you're trying to get, you know, gold and platinum uh, albums to get points. Everything ties really good into the theme. It's just the gameplay seemed a little bit too basic. And it's just really kind of climbing up those um, that turntable track to level up your skills to play better, bigger and better cards. Um, nothing terrible about it. It just it, it wasn't really my style of game. It's just kind of a point salad game where you're playing cards, trying to get it. And um, yeah, it was it was OK. It had some some good humor with the different rappers um, that they're clearly poking fun at or playing homage to. Um, but yeah, that is Rap Gods. Uh, I played it a couple times and then just, it, it was okay. Nothing great, nothing terrible. I just didn't really like it. Um, next up leaving my collection is Spyfall. So if you haven't played Spyfall, um, Spyfall, they have multiple versions of this out now. They have a DC Spyfall, they have a Spyfall 2, they have a Spy Fest, which is a version of this. Um, but in Spyfall, essentially what it is is, um, a group of players um, are all dealt out cards um, from a particular location, and they will all have a job assigned to them at that location. So maybe at a casino, one player is not part of uh, the crew. They're not in the know. They are the spy. So what they're trying to do is figure out where everyone is, what location they're at, and find out before either they're found out or, um, you know, they blurt out the wrong answer and give the wrong answer. Um, so the way it works is um, basically goes around the table and whoever starts picks somebody and asks them a question. They answer the question and then that person can in turn ask someone else a question. And what you're trying to do is feel out who is on your team by asking vague yet specific questions that can hopefully get vague yet specific answers so that you know that I'm on the same team as you and everyone at the table knows that you're on the same team as the rest of us. Meanwhile, the spy is trying to decipher the clues that are being given to figure out where they're at. Um, it is fun. It does take a little bit of ice breaking. So if you're not in um, a type of crowd that likes to talk a lot and, and joke around and stuff, um, sometimes it can just stall out with people not knowing what to ask or how to answer. Um, but I think the biggest, the biggest uh, misstep of the game, um, or the bit not misstep of the game, but the biggest fault of the game is that there's a ton of locations. Like there's, I don't know how many decks of cards there's in here. Thirty different, um, thirty different di uh, locations, and some of them are very unique, and some of them are very samey. Um, and the problem is, is that the only locations, the only place you can see the locations is in the middle of the book and it has a list of all the locations. However, if you're caught looking at the book, everyone kind of knows you're the spy. Um, so this game really requires the same group of friends to play a lot and know all the locations off the top of their head so that they're not caught looking in the book. Or what we used to do is we would take pictures on our phone and everyone would leave their phone out. But even then, it's hard to, you know, not look at your phone if you're trying to figure out where it could possibly be, especially if you don't know all the locations. And like I said, some of them are very specific and they're like a time frame. Like, uh, I, I forgot the times that are in. It's been a while since I played, but um, it's a fun game. It just kind of wore out its welcome. And there's other party games that I think 
do the party aspect better and um, are a little bit more fair and don't, you know, you don't get outed just because you're looking at the the book um, or you're trying to figure out where you're at. And that's it's it's got this steep barrier of entry for new players because they don't know all 30 locations and they could just, you know, try to guess. But, you know, if they have no idea what's even in the in the box, um, then they don't know where they could possibly guess. Right. So there's like pirate ships and prisons and and a battlefield and like a specific battlefield from a specific time. There's like an, an island, a casino, a hotel. Um, so it's just really difficult for new players to kind of grasp at it. It's always fun, but the spy, unless they played quite a few times or is, are very sly at, you know, sneaking peeks at stuff, they're not going to, they're not really going to excel. Um, so yeah, that's Spyfall leaving my collection. Uh, let's see. Next up, we've got Apollo, a game inspired by NASA moon missions. So this is from Buffalo uh, Games and Puzzles. And this right here is really uh, two missions in the box. And um, the way it works is one player is playing Mission Control and the other players are playing astronauts. And essentially what they need to do is um, they're going to blast off and do an orbit around. um, One will go just around the world uh, like an orbit. And then the actual next Apollo mission will go to the moon and land and I think take off and come back. Mission control um, will be drawing cards to like deal out different um, scenarios that need to be solved. And the players um, get to roll dice and try to solve the puzzles and solve, you know, complete the missions within a specific time frame. So as they move through space, each like space they move is a turn. And when they hit certain spots, they need to be um, through a particular set of missions. Otherwise, it's an auto fail. So um, it is a fun game. Um, it's got the two missions. It just requires. Um, it doesn't really require anything special. It just it's it's less a game and more a puzzle. And it really doesn't work um, with just uh, you know two people. It works better when you have three or four people playing. Um, it is it is pretty fun. I liked it. It's got the two missions. Um, you can, you know, completely replay them again and again because the, um, the scenarios and stuff that are come out are random. Um, so they do have like two different decks of cards that go with um, each mission or a deck for each mission. So you won't get stuff that you can't possibly complete, but they are randomized. So you do get a little bit of uh, modular setup and randomness. And it is different playing the mission control because mission control has to do very specific things. And the astronauts have to do very specific things. And sometimes they're on a timer. Sometimes they're not. Um, It's a fun game, but I've played it a couple times. And yeah, it's just something that doesn't hit the table anymore. uh, And I'm going to make room for something else. So that is Apollo NASA Moon Missions. Uh, Next up, we've got Forbidden Sky. So Forbidden Sky is by GameRite. It's part of the Forbidden series. So you have Forbidden Island, Forbidden, Forbidden Desert. I believe this was the third one, which is uh, Forbidden Sky, Height of Danger. Uh, In this one, it's um, got a pretty cool toy factor to it. If you take a look at the back here, Um, basically these little connectors, these little connecting uh, rods here are actually, um, they're metallic on the inside. So they are completing a circuit. And what you need to do is um, build a um, certain, you know, layout of these, uh, little power icons um, that are these little metal things that are going to go down on the board. Um, and you are going to, you know, connect routes between them to try and power up this, uh, this rocket, which will light up whenever you get power to it. Um, so you're working together, you're uncovering tiles, you have like very strict um, tile placement um, that you can do. Um, you have to fight with the wind. Um, it is a fun game. Uh, but it's just kind of one of the ones that don't make it to the table as often. It is very light. Um, it's a fun game and the toy factor on it's really cool. So maybe, you know, someone with, uh, younger kids will get a kick out of it and, um, you know, it'll go to a happy home. I played this probably, uh, maybe 10 or 11 times. And I, I think I got my worth out of it. It was pretty good. Um, so yeah, forbidden sky, not a whole lot to say about that one.
Next up, we have Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons. And this is coming, if you can see behind me, um, I have a lot of Ravensburger's games. Um, I like the the IP tie-in and the fact that they're typically around 30 bucks. I did get this one on clearance. I waited for it to go on clearance. Um, this is a pandemic style game uh, and you are playing Amazons. Um, so you're playing uh, Wonder Woman, not Wonder Woman, but you're playing as Diana um, and some of the other Amazonian uh, women. And then you have three different bosses that all do something slightly different. And essentially what you're trying to do is um, stop things from, you know, clearing threats off the board like you would in Pandemic. Um, but you get cards that allow you to um, do specific actions on your turn. And um, the way the cards work is down at the bottom, they have different icons on them that allow you to move or fight or, you know, learn or gather troops. And the... The catch to this, the the draw that I thought was going to be really cool was that um, it's got two phases to um, the game. So it's a co-op um, and typically in co-op, you have all this open information. But the way this game works is it breaks up the the player phase into two phases. So at the, the first phase, you're going to deal out uh, three cards to everyone. Now, some players get different, you know, loadouts of cards during this time, but um, they're going to get three cards dealt to them. Um, they're going to uh, look at their cards, or maybe it's more than three cards. They get some cards dealt to them. They're going to look at their cards. They're going to coordinate with their their uh, teammates, and they say, hey, I'm going to go over here, and then on my second turn, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to go over here and do this. And everyone kind of works together showing, uh, you know, planning and strategizing. Then once that phase is done, you, put, you lock your cards in. Uh, you put them down. Uh, you don't lock them in yet. You put them down. And then the uh, the next phase starts, which is like the tactics phase, where this is your inactive battle. So you get a couple more cards, and now you may get better cards that change what you want to do. So maybe before you couldn't move, and now you want to move. But you've already told your, your teammates, like, hey, I'm going to stand here and fight these guys, um, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise some troops. But now you got this move card, so it's going to allow you to go somewhere else and maybe pick up one of the artifacts or go hit the boss. Um, so you've told your, your teammates what you're going to do, but now you're going to do this other thing because it makes more sense, to, uh, you know, strategically or tactically. Um, and then you're going to do that. And then when it, whenever it comes time to actually do the, the fighting or the, the, the you know, the, the resolution phase, you flip over your cards and it's like it's like a programming. All right. So you flip over your first card and then everyone does their thing. Flip over your next card. And everyone's like, oh, you said you were going to do this. So I didn't go over there. But now you didn't do that. So um, the problem is, is that there's just not a diff enough differentiation in the cards so that your, your plans rarely change much from what they are. Um, you can't really play it solo because of that, that, you know, unknown second set of cards that you get. So it doesn't really work as a solo game. Um, and it's just the the um, the differences in the cards that you get. There's just too many duplicates. Um, what they needed, I think, was. Um, they needed more unique cards so that whenever you got something, it was vastly different than what you already had in your hand. But a lot of times you'd end up getting like two or three of the same cards. So it didn't really matter. Your strategy was going to stay the same from when you talked to when you went into battle. And I think that was where this game kind of fell flat. The production value on it's pretty good. The minis, um, come and they look like bronze statues, which is really cool. Um, cause it kind of fits the, you know, the, the theme. The board looks really nice. Um, the the bosses, they do not have um, miniatures. They just have standees, but the art's really cool on, on their stuff, on their cards. Um, but yeah, it just, it kind of fell flat because that, that two-phase system um, just kind of didn't work. It almost feels like it was tacked on, like they they realized their game was a little bit too easy. So they say, hey, what about if we, if we only allow you to look at half your cards and then the next part, you um, secretly choose cards, except there's not enough differentiation in the cards to make that even worthwhile. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that much because usually you're going to get, you know, a duplicate of the same card you've already got, or it might change you up from moving four to moving six. You know, it's not, it's not a big deal. So um, I wanted to like this one, but uh, maybe someone with a Wonder Woman, you know, uh, collector bug will want to get it and play it. It is a good game. It's just, 
it, it probably would work better with younger players. So that was uh, Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons. Um, next up is this little uh, game here called Fantasy Defense, and it's expansion, um, which is actually a campaign called the Stone King. Now, this is a, a one to two player game. And essentially what you're trying to do is um, each round, a bunch of bad guys are going to come and um, try to tear down your city. So you have these walls that have numbers on them and you are um, trying to anticipate based on what you've seen and what you know is coming to try and anticipate where all of the bad guys are going to go and play cards from your hand that are going to stop them, kill them, or move them around. Um, it's a cool premise. Um, it does play pretty well solo. Two player also plays pretty good because now you're, you can share um, stuff since your walls are shared, I believe. It's been a while since I've played it. Um, the big problem I have with it, and I never even got into this, uh, the big problem I have with it is that it's just really mathy. Um, it's, it has all this cool artwork. You can play as like, you know, elves and uh, I think there's like dwarves and, and humans. So it's got this kind of high fantasy theme going on. But at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of numbers. And you're basically playing math to, to figure out where your numbers are going to go and try to get the best combos off using the numbers on the cards. Um, so you could pretty much play this game without any of the art. Just have numbers and effects on the cards and you would get the same basic feel. So although I like the game, I like what it's doing mechanically. There's just that there's just kind of a disconnect on the theme. It's very theme light um, and it just feels like I'm crunching numbers. And when I'm playing, a, you know, a game called Fantasy the de Defense with, you know, all this high fantasy artwork and characters and all these big monsters, I don't want to do math problems to try and figure out, you know, the turn. I want to fight and do things. And this just doesn't feel like I'm doing that. It feels like I'm playing a numbers game, just trying to beat numbers out. The The only real, like, the, the big catch to it is you do feel clever whenever you can, um, you know, properly guess where things are going to come out and how they're going to, you know, move around the board or, you know, fr move around your walls. And predicting that and being able to lay your cards out in a specific way that's going to target things and, you know, have this cascade effect. It is, it does give you a, a nice feeling. You feel clever, but um, there's just, there's just not enough going on in the box for me, narration wise, um, you know, thematically. But, you know, it was from Kickstarter. I, I got, you know, probably four or five plays out of it. And, um, you know, it's just time for it to, to go into the pile of, you know, Go away. <laughs> um, next up, let's just go with uh, the Visitor and Blackwood Grove. So uh, this is kind of like E.T. the board game before E.T. the board game. So in this, um, a visitor lands in Blackwood Grove and um, he is trying to connect with a child um, just like E.T. in order to... Um, allow the child into his um, kind of shield, his safety bubble, um, so that he can, you know, fix his ship and phone home and go home. Um, their other players are going to play different um, agencies like CIA, the FBI, the NSA, whatever. Um, the It's got a kind of a, a, a cool mechanic in that um, the alien um, determines what's going to get through his shield. So it could be, you know, things that are red, things that are smaller than a bread box, things that are made of metal. Um, and basically what happens is, is you get decks of cards or you get hands of cards. And um, as a player, you put down one of those cards and the alien gives you, you know, kind of a thumbs up or thumbs down, whether or not it gets through his shield. And um, the players are trying to figure out what exactly gets through the shield. So if it's things that are made of metal and somebody puts you know, a, um, a car down, the car has metal, it has rubber, it has glass, it has cloth, it has an engine, it's a machine. Um, so that only narrows it down to, well, these things I know could possibly get through. So then another player may play, you know, something that just has an engine or something that's just metal. And then whether or not it passes, you know, you're ruling stuff out. And as the, um, the child gets, more and more guesses correct, 
um, the the level increases of trust so that they can play more cards and get more information than everyone else at the table. Um, and then basically the way the game ends is one player decides to make a, a guess and um, gets a handful of cards, puts a bunch of them out, what they think will pass, and then the alien says yes or no. The, the kind of the problem with it is, is um, it's got a lot of gray area for what the alien can decide passes or what you agree on is in the artwork. Some things are very cut and dry. Some things are maybe you have a, a, a mistake of what you think it is, something that's, you know, smaller than, you know, a car. Well, what kind of car? You know, are we going with a full size sedan? Or are we going with, you know, a, a, a two seater, you know, a smart car? So there's all this like weird wiggle room and it gets it, it can get it can throw off people that are playing because, you know, you say, well, that didn't get through because of X, Y or Z. But this one does. But it kind of like from the player's point of view that's trying to guess, it kind of looks like they're the same thing. But the alien has this like really finite detail of what one is versus the other. And because one thing gets failed, then it may throw everyone in the game off. And then the game just, I think, eventually times out after a certain amount of rounds and everyone loses. Um, so it's a cute game. Uh, it's another one that I picked up, um, I think, at a Target clearance sale. It is fun. It probably would work if you have, um, if you're not taking it too seriously. It's a very short game. Um, it says on the box, you know, five to 15 minutes. That's probably about right. Um, but it's just, you know, it's, I have other party games that do this better and aren't as complicated to explain. Um, and have a better, you know, kind of reward payoff. Um, so, uh, let's see, let's do, uh, let's do one more in this video and then I'm going to cut. I still have some more, but I'll go ahead and split that into another video. Let's go with uh, the next one on the list. Dream on. So this was, uh, a game from Simon. Um, this was something that they were, you know, trying when they were trying to branch out and get away from doing all these big giant minis heavy games. Um, the idea of this is kind of a storytelling game where you're you're telling a dream and um, you have cards and um, you're basically trying to put together a story and then other people are trying to kind of uh, tag onto that story. So it's it's mainly for, you know, younger kids. Um, it's two to eight players. I don't really know, you know, um, if there's really a way to lose this game. I actually never got this to the table. Um, I played it because. There was a time when we had, you know, a lot of younger nephews and nieces and we were always looking for something to play. And I figured, you know, this is something that's cool um, to, to try out. Um, it's a co-op game, so there's no like us versus them. Everyone kind of works together. Um, but it's just kind of sat on my shelf for years. Um, I did get this at a warehouse clearance sale, um, I think. Um, and I figured, oh, I'll give it a shot. Um, it's got, you know, cool, cute artwork on the cards. Um, it's not quite to the level of like, um, a Dixit or, or a Mysterium, but it, it's similar in vain. You're playing cards similar to that and trying to put together details and form this dream. Um, so it's kind of like a, a, a storytelling game. It's just the nieces and nephews have grown out of it before I ever really got a chance to play Like it on the box. It says it's seven plus. So I'm hoping maybe this will pass on to someone who has, you know, younger kids and will want to give it a shot with their kids and, you know, maybe they'll have a good time with it. But that is Dream On by Simon. So I think that's where I'm going to end this video. Um, I do have some more to get through, but um, that was the first wave. So I think I'll just stop it there. Um, if you've played any of these games and you, you think I'm wrong or have the wrong opinion on why I shouldn't get rid of them or why I should like them, hit me up in the comments. Let me know. Um, as always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, check in the description notes below for uh, a link to our discord. Come over and chat with us and tell us whatever you want to tell us. Are you with us about games? Tell me why you think I'm dumb for getting rid of some of these games or if you think I'm spot on or whatever. As always, thanks for watching and happy gaming.